Um, so as you can see from my these, some of these movies, my career um, did not start in children's media. Um, but recently, since I've been a mom of two amazing boys, you want to stand up, guys? Say hi. Um, and I've watched, that's Asher and Emmanuel. And I watched how much how much media impacts their lives. Um, I started to focus my attention more on, on children's content, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so my kids are, are mildly addicted to their devices, and my devices, and Anthony's device, my husband is right there. Um, and we're all very tethered to these devices and communicating with each other more and more through social media. And our kids are gaming all the time and playing with apps, and even at the most tender ages. I'm always amazed on the subway in New York when I see like a, a kid who could barely even hold anything holding her mom's phone. But rather than mourn the loss of a sort of simpler, less connected time, I really am excited about what's happening um, with technology and the opportunity it's offering to a whole world of filmmakers who have limitless reach. And regardless of the platform, whether it's a TV show or a webisode or an episode or a video or a TV show or a video game, whatever it is, it's all about storytelling. And in the words of Asher, because of new technology, we can create things we couldn't do before, which is pretty amazing given that he's only 10. So <laughs> um, and it's always excited me to imagine using media to change behavior and have a positive impact on the world. And I, when I was a very young child, I was um, sort of brought up to think about doing good. And as a Jewish person, uh, the concept of tikkun olam, I don't know how many of you have heard of that expression, but it means to repair the world. And I was brought up believing that was an integral part of what it was to be alive. And I always wanted to figure out ways of, of helping. But somehow I became a filmmaker. I was very, very lucky. My brother was at a party when I, right after I graduated from college and he met somebody who was working on a movie who was looking for people to help on the movie and I ended up getting a job for, for working for free on a very, very, you know, I just, it was a pretty impressive film, I have to say. How do I make this go? Just press like that? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> have, who has seen it? Uh, it became a cult classic. Um, I started out as the as a PA working for free. Then I was the costume designer. Um, I was told to go out and buy a hat for the, the the main actor, and I said, "Okay, how much money can I spend?" And they said nothing. Um, and I came back practically crying because I had spent two dollars at the Salvation Army, and I said, "I'll pay for it myself." Um, and then I became the production manager, really because I was the only person that was still breathing and. Uh, um, <laughs> From there, I, um, it stuck. I loved making movies, I loved production, and I just kept working on films. And I would go from film to film, and I moved out to LA, and I was meeting a lot of people from other countries. And I got very excited about what their lives were like and where they were from, and I had a real travel bug. So I went from movie to Russia, movie to Czechoslovakia, movie to Southeast Asia. And I just started to travel a lot all through film people and meeting people that I, um, I realized that I had a common language with. And some of those experiences were actually very, very profound, like being in the former Soviet Union and the, what, the, what is now the Czech Republic before the fall of communism and actually during the fall of communism. Um, and I was exposed to poverty and injustice and human rights abuses that I had not experienced before. And I really wanted to figure out a way that I could do something that would be of service. Um, but I didn't think that I could because I was making really classy movies. <laughs> um, and then in 1999, I heard a report on the radio that was a war in Kosovo and refugees were fleeing Kosovo. Um, by the thousands, and I was listening to NPR in, in our in New York, and I heard the journalist talking about 
life in a refugee camp and how unrelenting boredom, hopelessness, psychological trauma. And I had worked on a Preston Sturgis film that I co-produced, and I remembered um, a line from one of the movies. Maybe we could play that first clip. You're sorry to disappoint Yes, and I say it with some embarrassment, but I don't want to make O Brother Where Art Thou. You don't want to make O Brother Where Art Thou? No, and I say it with some embarrassment. I want to make a comedy. You say it with some embarrassment? He doesn't want to make a brother or off now. He wants to make a comedy. He don't mean that, boss. He's still a little stir-crazy. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, I'm not. You're joking, aren't you, Sully? It's in bad taste, but it's a joke. No. But it's had more publicity than the Johnstown flood. What are we going to do with all that publicity? Oh, brother. Why don't you want to make old brother where art thou, Sully? Well, in the first place, I'm too happy to make old brother where art thou. In the second place, I haven't suffered enough to make O Brother Where Art Thou. You haven't suffered enough. He hasn't suffered enough. No. But, Sully... I'll tell you something else. There's a lot to be said for making people laugh. Did you know that's all some people have? It isn't much, but it's better than nothing in this cockeyed caravan. So I thought about that movie. And I thought about that line. And... I called a good friend of mine who was a filmmaker from Bosnia, and I said, it was a Sunday morning, I was in bed, I was like, I just, I've got to help these refugees. <laughs> and I said, Adamir, what if, um, what if we brought movies to the refugees? What if we set up screenings for the kids? And he said, that's a great idea. And when we were in Sarajevo and the city was under siege, we held a film festival and people ran to the theater at risk of being killed by sniper fire just to get someone to feed them. And I had just worked with Jane Rosenthal and Robert De Niro, so I thought, they're pretty influential people. <laughs> so I called Jane, and she said, that's a really great idea. I'll call Bob. And the next thing I knew, this thing started to spiral. And I found myself, six weeks later, partnering with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Didn't know who they were when I first started this whole thing. Um, and I was in Macedonia. And I hired a local crew. Again, the filmmakers from around the world. I had a friend that was knew some people in Macedonia. And we started showing movies. And we started showing entertaining films. And I realized immediately that we were gathering thousands of people to come to these outdoor screenings and that we could use the screens also to provide information. UNICEF was passing out a landmine awareness brochure. We videotaped it and then projected it and reached so many more people that way. And Film Aid was born, and we kept working throughout that entire refugee crisis, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees said, can you please bring this to Africa? I was like, I'm not an aid worker, this is crazy. And she said, there have been refugees in camps for decades. And Film Aid started in Africa in 2001, and actually this, is, this week is our 15th anniversary of when I had the idea for Film Aid.